But we come at the test Zion Amid Aleph, the art of humility. Very often you'll find that how a person behaves after an event tells you much more about how they feel about the authenticity of what they're doing during the event. So, for example, many, many years ago we were in in Kyoto and we stood at, at a distance. We were watching a temple service and it was out in the open air so we could see it from far. And, and people were, were throwing their coins into a big yard before the service took place. And a lot of poor people were throwing their coins into this yard and the yard was filled with, with coins. And then you saw the, the priests do their services, whatever they did. And then people went and the temple seemed to close down and all the, all the money is left on the, on the yard. So we decided to wait to see what happens with the money. And we had to wait for over an hour. Eventually, the priests come out they're now no longer dressed in their holy clothes. And they sweep the money into pans, and with the pans they put, them in, they put their coins into big bags, and then they schlep the bags off. But was, what was interesting to see was these serious priests who'd been doing this temple service an hour earlier suddenly became like little teenagers just having discovered a treasure chest. The fun and the laughter and, and the, the joy, the, there was nothing holy about that. That was just counting the loot. And it was so in contrast. So sometimes it's after the event when nobody's looking that you can tell how authentic the event was. And everybody's looking, people are on show, people are on form, they're, they're at their best. But afterwards, behind closed doors, that's when you really can see whether humility, for example, is authentic or it isn't authentic. Is it just a show or is it, is it something authentic? And we see this in our, in our Gemara where the Gemara says at the bottom of Daftes Zayin Omad Aleph, it's a b'risa, Shidro shel adam l'achar sheva shanim, the backbone of a person, the spine of a person after seven years after his death, na'ase nachash becomes a snake. V'hanimili deloi kara b'modim, that's only if he's somebody who didn't used to bow down in modim. When he said Shmon Esri, he didn't use, or he didn't say Shmon Esri at all. If he did say Shmon Esri, he didn't bow down in Modim, then that would happen. But if this is somebody who would bow down in Modim, then that wouldn't be the case. That wouldn't happen. The toast for this piece of Gomorrah is on uh, Omid Bayes. That's where it's printed. And there the toast for says, Lefisha mitzvah lichroa, because there's a mitzvah to bow down. And the mitzvah is that when you stand up from the bowing down, you uncoil yourself. You stand up like, like a snake uncoiling itself. You don't just stand up straight. You, you roll yourself up as you stand up from the bow. As you found, find with Rav Sheshit in Masechet Brochus, it's mida kenegid mida. Hashem is giving the person mida kenegid mida. When I say nachash, there on shor she gnai ulo b'mashenei na na say nachash. That's his punishment that he's made. Is that his spine becomes a snake? That's gnai. That's that's kind of dis disgraceful for him. That's shaming for him. And that's his punishment for not bowing down during modim. Says Tosfos. And the Maral explains the relationship between the snake and, and the person. And he says, because in the beginning, this is in, in the Tivot Olam, the Tiv Avoid, the Perik Yud, in the beginning, Adam was, and, and the snake were the two upright beings. They were the only two upright beings. Adam was the ruler over the whole world down below, and, and uprightness shows dominance. And the snake was upright, and he dominated the animal world. But there was a difference between the snake and the, and the human, says the Maral. The human learned how to bow before God. I'm dominant before men. I understand that I am the, the ruler of the lower world. But when it comes to Hashem, I'm nothing and I bow down. The snake couldn't do that. The snake could never change his posture of uprightness. He always had to act as the, do, as the dominant one. And so this person who doesn't bow and mood him is showing that he too cannot submit himself and surrender himself to the higher power of Hashem, the, the Maral explains. The Tosfos, often when you learn, whether it's a Tosfos or a Rashi or a piece of Gomorrah, and it doesn't resonate, something's bothering you, you've got to stop and you've got to articulate what it is. And to see what, what's bothering about this Tosfos, perhaps it's more important to, to look at the Gomorrah that the Tosfos quotes, which we had in Brochus on Daf Yud Beis. There Rav Sheshes Ki Kara, when Rav Sheshes used to bow, when did he used to bow? Rashi says, Be'avot 
twice in the beginning of the Shmona Esra, once in Modim, and once at the end of the Hoda'ah in the Shmona Esra. That's when he would bow. Kara Kechizra, he bowed like a plank, straight down. Not, not, not step by step. We don't do that. The Mogan Avron says in, in, in Shulchan Aruch that we do it the way, the way we do. We, we bend our knees in Baruch and we bow down for our time. We stand up for Hashem. And that comes from the Zohar. This is one of the few cases where our minag is like the Zohar, not like the Gemara. The Gemara says, Rav Sheshit, Ki kara, kara he just went down in one, in one movement. We do it in two movements. But the important part is Ki Zakiv, Zakiv Kechivya. When he was to stand up, he stood up, he uncoiled like a snake. That's the origin of this whole idea. That kind of, and that's why Tosva says it's Mido Keneged Mido. Why does the spine become like a snake? Because you didn't uncoil like a snake. So what, what is the question? What's bothering about this? There are two things that are bothering about this. Firstly, what, what is Rav Sheshe talking about? This whole, the origin is, is the Gemara and Brochus Daf Yud Beis. What is the Gemara and Daf Yud Beis talking about? Four Kriot. In the Shmona Esra. What Kriya are we talking about here? Modim. Nothing is about Modim. What about the others? Is this, why is this specific to Modim? And the second thing is, the snake part of the Kriya, where is that? In the bowing or in the standing? It's in the standing. And what does the Gemara say here? That, that because somebody didn't bow in, in Modim, his shedra, his spine becomes like a snake. And the, and the source for that says, Tosfus is Rav Sheshis in Brok Staff Yud Beis. But Rav Sheshis says, you stand up like a snake. That's how you get up. And the Gemara is talking about how you bow. So why is that Mido Keneged Mido? It, it, it doesn't work. So when you learn this Tosfus, it just doesn't work. And, and that's when it's important. When that happens, it's really important that you stop and you articulate what is it that doesn't seem to be working for you? It doesn't matter whether you can answer it or not. That's, that's far less important. What's important is that you don't just move on, that you stop and you, and you question, how can I articulate what's really bothering me? And those are the two caches. Those are the two things that are bothering in this Tosfus. Number one, we're talking about all the, bro, all the bowings. Why does this Gemara, why does the Brisa pick Modim? And number two, says the, uh, is Rav Sheshis talks about the way you stand up, not the way you bow down. Why does the Brayser talk here about the way you, you bow down? So to understand this, we've got to look very carefully at the Rashi in Brochus. This is, again, an example where there's a parallel sugya. Tosfus says it all refers to Brochus Daf Yud Beis. You've got to pull out your Brochus Daf Yud Beis, and you've got to learn the Gemara in Brochus together with the Gemara here in order to understand it. So Rashi says, Kishu korea ba'avot v'hoda'a, korea bevaruch v'zokef et atzmo, kishu mazkir et Hashem, al shem Hashem zokef kufufim. And when you stand up, the, you stand up in, with the word Hashem because in your mind is the posuk of Hashem zokef kufufim. Hashem makes the, the, those who bent down upright. So what, what are you doing with the bowing down and the standing up? The important part is the standing up because you're acknowledging that your uprightness comes from Hashem. You're bowing down only in order to stand up. That's what Rashi is saying. This is not just you bow down, now you've got to stand up again, otherwise how do you carry on davening? So you stand up. No, the standing up is the important part of the bowing down. You only bow down in order to be able to stand up, according to, to, according to Rashi. And therefore the way you stand up becomes important. And Rav Sheshis would un uncoil himself like a snake. He wouldn't just stand up at once. He would uncoil himself like a snake. And we'll see why, why that's important. Says Rashi, Zakif Kechivra, why would he stand up like a snake? Benachat. He would go down quickly in one go. But he would get up benachat, slowly. Roshot Chila, first he would lift his head up and then he would lift the rest of his body up and then eventually he would stand up completely. It's a slow, fluid movement, unlike the bowing down, which is quick. You bow down quickly because you want to get to that down level of surrendering to Hashem and then Hashem Zakev Kufufim. And then the main expression of humility is in the way you get up, not just in the bowing down. And why is it important to get up slowly? Shelo terae kriato alav kemasui so that it doesn't look as if your bowing is a burden on you. And you want to get out of, that, out of that posture as quickly as possible. You're uncomfortable there, doesn't feel good, you want to get out of it and you quickly stand up. 
You want to demonstrate that it, slowly. No, no, I'm, this is my natural place. I need to be bowing down before Hashem. That's natural for me. It's Hashem's okay Kufim. The only reason I stand upright is because Hashem gives me permission to. If Hashem didn't give me permission to, I would never stand upright. I would always be bowed down. And if I stand up quickly, I'm demonstrating that my natural position is standing. My unnatural position is, is bowing. And what would that mean if I demonstrate that my natural position is upright and my unnatural position is bowing? Then what am I doing when I'm bowing? I'm faking it. I'm pretending. You can see from the way I get up that I'm not sincere about the bowing. If I was sincere about the bowing, I would get up slowly. Since I rush up, that shows, that's like the Ramban says in, in Baalois, it's like a child, the Bnei Israel left Har Sinai and they ran. That's why they say when you leave shul, don't run out of shul, walk out of shul slowly, so that it doesn't look like a tinoka borach mi beit sefer, like a child running from school. What's wrong if the child runs from school? At least he's at school. No, but he shows that if he's running from school, then he doesn't want to be at school. He wants to be playing, he wants to be playing ball, he doesn't want to be at school. So all the time he was at school, why was he at school? L'shem Shemayim? Because he wants to learn Torah? No, he was at school because his parents and his teachers told him he had to. The moment he can get out, he's out. So for a child, we understand that. But for an adult, the way we leave something demonstrates how seriously we take the thing that we leave. If we rush away from something, it means that we were never truly engaged in that thing in the first place. To slowly move away from it shows you were engaged in it and it was there. So to bow down and surrender oneself to Hashem, that's the act of humility. Yes, I'm upright. Humility doesn't mean I'm always bowed down. Humility doesn't mean I'm a gornet, I'm a nothing, I'm a nobody. No, Hashem made me king of the Tachtonim. I am the dominant being down below in the world. I elevate this world. I contribute to this world. I influence this world. I inspire this world. I stand upright. But before Hashem, I'm nothing. In, in the world, I'm a, I'm a valuable human being and I have an important role to play, play. But when I'm in front of Hashem, I'm nothing. That's what bowing down is. That's that expression of humility. But the important part of the bowing down is, is the zokef kufim, is the standing upright again. And so that's what Tosfus means. When Tosfus says, Mido keneged mido v'nase nachash, ze on shoshe g'nai hu lo b'mayshe nase nachash, he says that, lefi she mitzvah lichroa v'chi zakiv zakiv kechivya. Look at Tosfus' words. The mitzvah is to bow down and when standing up, to stand up like a snake. That's the mitzvah. The mitzvah is not just bow down and when you finish the mitzvah of bowing, you stand up again. No, the standing up is part of the mitzvah. The way you stand up defines the mitzvah. And the way this person stands up demonstrates that his mitzvah was fake. And that's what the nachash is. The nachash is a manipulator. The nachash, before his chet, before the chet and before the nachash was cursed, the nachash stood firm, stood high like a human being. And says the, the, the ma'aral, he was the closest being to the human being of all the beings. Otherwise, how could he have persuaded Chava? How could he have wanted to marry Chava? How could he have had an intimate relationship with Chava if he wasn't almost human? And says the, the Maharal, said so the Menachash is almost human. What's the difference? If you take yourself back to those moments before the curse of the snake, and you looked at the snake and you looked at a human being, what would be the difference? Just the authenticity, just the seriousness, the sincerity. The human being stands up and knows how to bow. The snake stands up and knows how to deceive, how to make you think that he knows how to bow, how to make you think that he serves Hashem, how to make you think that he understands what his uprightness is. But in truth, from the way, with the way he behaves later, you see he doesn't. This is insincere. This is fake. This is something that is, uh, that is manipulative. The snake is the essence of manipulation. And the Odom is an up, upright being, upright in the metaphorical sense as well as the physical sense. An Odom is an upright being. And that's why the snake is exposed. Hashem says, get down. You won't even have legs at all. You'll go around on your stomach. You are so low down. You have no uprightness. An animal at least has even a worm, has a little bit of uprightness. It has legs. You have no uprightness. Everything you had was just a fake. Everything you had was insincere. But the Odom, the Odom has true uprightness. That we see that in a, in a medrash in, in Breshis, Omer Rabbi Levi, La'atid lavo, in the future, Hakol mitrap in. Everybody who has been afflicted with disease will be cured. Chutz mi nachash ve'givonim. Just not the nachash and the givonim. Who are the givonim? 
they fooled, they tricked Yeshua, isn't that right? Into thinking that they were not one of the, the, tri the, the nations that had to be wiped out. They, were, they manipulated him. So that was a midah of Nachash. It's interesting, the Medrash puts the Givonim and the Nachash together to show that these are both, they have the same issue. They're both punished for their manipulativeness, for their insincerity. That's what they were punished for. And that you never get kapora for. That never goes away. If everything you did was insincere, then wh where's the kapora? Kapora is sometimes you were sincere, sometimes you weren't. You made a mistake, you slipped up. But genuinely and generally you believe in what you're doing. But if you don't believe in what you're doing and everything is just manipulation and everything is sheker, then there's no opportunity for, for kapora. And that's what the, what the nachash is. And that's why if a person doesn't bow down correctly in, in Shwan Esra, it's interesting in Japan, we started off talking about in Japan, they know how to bow down. There are lots of rules and laws about bowing. Who bows lower, the more, the more junior person bows lower than the more senior person. Who bows first, who responds with a bow, the different types of bows for different situations. Very complex maze of laws around bowing and norms around bowing. They understand the principle of bowing. We, we have that as well. But what's important with us is not just how you bow, but how you stand up. And it's through the way that you stand up that you're able to demonstrate that your bowing is your natural state, to be bowed down, surrendered before the Rebbein HaShulelam. And it's Hashem Zokev Kufim. The only reason I can stand upright and be dominant in the world is because Hashem gave me that capacity and Hashem gave me that right. Mm -hmm.